All right, good morning. Good morning. So there was a man, <laughs> and he had um, a parrot. And the parrot was a constant source of embarrassment to him because the parrot would swear a blue streak every time he came into the room. He did everything he could. He tried talking to the parrot again and again, saying, please, don't curse like that. But every time he asked the parrot not to curse, it actually got even worse. I mean, the parrot would have made a sailor blush. The man tried covering the cage with a blanket and keeping him covered. He would just, you know, he got so frustrated, he put the parrot in the kitchen cupboard for a while. And, and that didn't do any good when the parrot came out. He was just swearing even more than ever. And then finally, in absolute frustration, he grabbed the parrot out of the cage and shook it and said, I've had it. And he opened the freezer door and he tossed the parrot into the freezer and he shut the freezer door. And he stood there thinking, well, what do I do now? When he noticed, it got very, very quiet. And so he waited just a few minutes, and he opened the freezer door, and there was his parrot, all frosty on the edges of his feathers and his beak. And he took the parrot out, and the parrot said, OK, I'll really, really work on my language. I promise I will do my best to not swear again. Ever. The guy was really impressed. You know, wow, this is great. This is really great. So he said, OK, thank you. Thank you. A moment passed, and the parrot said, but I got to ask, what'd the chicken do? <laughs> so, Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so what I believe is so is that people are hungry for a freedom that will free them from, from want. Uh, they're hungry to be free from uh, sickness or loneliness or oppression or free from whatever their fears are. You know, the message of Jesus, very much like the message of the science of mind, is universal and also very, very practical. Jesus said that we could all do the things that he did and even greater things. Now, one of the things I've really uh, been looking at in preparation for this time of year is this idea of sin. And there has been taught the idea of original sin. But I want you to know that did not come out of Jesus' teaching. That was actually a creation that came along later out of uh, other organized organizations. Uh, it is... Uh, <laughs> Now, what I think is important here is to know that it is our destiny to produce a likeness in the world of the image that is within us. You know, that we are to manifest the inner life of the Spirit out here in the world. Now, Jesus taught there was this principle of divine sonship and daughtership. In other words, that there was divinity within each and every one of us. And he also supported and assisted and helped people rise from their sins. Now by sins, metaphysically, we mean errors. We mean false beliefs. We mean mistakes. We mean those occasions where you miss the mark. You know, again, I have to say, Jesus never calls anybody a sinner in the Gospels. He never says, you are a sinner. He says, go and sin no more. There's a big difference. And that distinction is the distinction we make between knowing I'm not my mistakes. I'm not the errors. I have made errors, I have made mistakes, but that does not define me. That's not all of who I am as a spiritual being. So what he says is, go and sin no more. Go and learn from your experience. Don't make the same mistake. We're all trying to do that even today. All right, so sin is, and I like this definition, a frustration of our divine potential. Isn't that good? I like that. That that's all it is, that it's a frustration of the divine potential that's already within us. So when Jesus said to his disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? It was Peter who responded, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds and says, bless you, Simon. He's like, you know, you got it. Simon, you have figured something out here. And he goes on to say, you know, this was not revealed to you through your physical eyes, but my father who is in heaven reveal this to you. By an inner revelation of the divinity that is within you, it didn't come by eyesight, it came by insight. You know, it didn't come by 
this physical thing, it came by a spiritual thing. This is important for us because Peter reveals his own divinity just by the fact that he sees Jesus' divinity. And this is one of the great gifts that we are able to do for each other. You know, and sometimes we have a hard time believing that there's divinity within us, especially if you're having a really bad day. Like it might be in everybody else, but it's certainly not right here where I am. Right? One of the great things we can do to get out of that is to start to recognize the divinity in others. And what that does is that lifts us up into a higher consciousness, into a higher vibration. So in the concept of the divinity of humankind, there is no inherently bad, sinful person. Right? There are people who are expressing themselves incompletely, and there are people who are expressing themselves doing a really extraordinary job frustrating their divine potential. This is the way we could look at it. They are just doing a superb, superb job frustrating the divine potential within them. And I know we've all done it, but that does not mean that we are sinners. We err. We make mistakes. We miss the mark. So my topic this morning is no more sin. So I know that Probably every person here, I know I certainly have, I've had experiences in my life where those experiences become like a signpost along the way, and that those experiences fundamentally change us, and that we're no longer the same person since that event or that experience. And so one of those events for me was finding new thought. And so religious science is a new thought church. We fall under a heading of uh, religious denominations and teaching that's called new thought. Until that point, religion for me was very much about resisting sin and resisting evil and resisting hell and resisting the devil and trying, like the devil, to be good. (laughs) Now, I will tell you that I really, I liked church. I loved going to church. I was drawn to church. But what I especially liked about church was to be in the church by myself alone because I felt like there was something there that wasn't being articulated in a way that, that, that served or, or, or fed me. So what happened is that with all this resisting sin and resisting evil and resisting hell and resisting the devil, I got pretty good at blocking a lot of that out. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think about it. Um, because what I knew was that I didn't need the church to tell me that I was bad. Because that was not actually helpful for me. Uh, But when I found new thought, specifically the science of mind, it was a game changer for me because new thought changed it all for me because new thought told me about the goodness within me and it helped me reach it. So that was really important because, because if there was no goodness within me, then I might as well forget the whole thing as far as I was concerned. Right? If that, you know, but Ernest Holmes called his teaching the science of mind and spirit. And so at the time when he was teaching this, the consciousness of humanity really needed the science of mind part. And so we focused on that a lot for people. And so we would say today that that was mental science. We really needed to learn to change our thinking in order to change our lives. That people really, really needed that. And we have done that, and that really works. And I'm here to tell you, I'm really good at that. You know, I know that this works, that if you change your thinking and keep it changed, you will change your life. I have proved that in my own life and experience again and again and again and again. Now you've heard me say that your thought is the most powerful, most creative thing you have to heal and grow and evolve and expand your life. Your thought. Your thought. And what that is, is change your thinking, change your life. So early on, we focus a lot on what we think and what we say. You know, we start to become accountable. We start to become responsible for all of it. I'm responsible for every thought and every word that comes out of my mouth. I'm responsible for all of it because it's all contributing to my experience of life. You know, so when you come to our foundation class, we really work on this. We really, really work on this. Now, in the scheme of, of, of spiritual teaching on the planet and the evolution of consciousness, this is the work of the Buddha. Watch your thought. You start to watch your thought, and then you engage in the practices of right thinking and right speech. Because Ernest said the Buddha, in his book, The Voice Celestial, Ernest said the Buddha was the very first to practice the science of mind. So we begin, we meditate, we we draw inward, we become quiet. 
and we start to picture a greater good for ourselves, and we affirm statements about our life and our health and our finances, and we do spiritual mind treatment, and we speak words of truth. Because until we have some mastery over this, there will be little progress spiritually. Because we are spirit cloaked in form, but we're in the world. And so part of it is that we have to learn to be in the world in a productive, responsible way. So we spend years, I'm here to tell you, years doing this. Because the principle is as within, so without. But there's also the science of spirit part. So the way Ernest used to say it is he would say, there's a power for good in the universe and you can use it. That's mental science. There's also a power for good in the universe and it can use you. That's the spiritual science part. And that spiritual science says that something good is going on here in the universe. Something good is going on and I'm a part of it. Right? So last week I said, uh, I used the word repent. People ran screaming. Out. Uh, <laughs> not, but, but, you know, when I was using the word repent, it was not as in regret and remorse, but to think again, to think in a new way, to turn in a new direction. So, you know, in the Bible, when John the Baptist is baptizing people to get them, he's not doing that to get them to regret <laughs> or to be remorseful, but to repent, to think in a new way. See, with the ritual of baptism, he would put people underwater. And he'd hold them underwater and keep it. This wasn't like a little light sprinkling. You know, this was like the big, okay, when you come up from this, you're going to have a new life. You're going to be different because of this. And he'd pull them down underwater. Now, I know if somebody were doing that to me, I would have a big reaction. Wouldn't you? You know, so he's holding them and holding them and holding them. And I can imagine that people would really be struggling and fighting back. And finally, when they came up, <laughs> It would be a new life, just like when you were born. Just like when you were born and that baby takes a first breath, it's a big breath. A baby isn't born and goes, Hee! you know, the baby takes a big breath. It's like, oh, now we're gonna, life is going to start. And this is what would happen after people were baptized because they were starting to think in a new way. And so we could see that baptism was a signpost along the way for people to be changed by that experience so that their new life would start now. For Emma Curtis Hopkins, repent is to turn from what we are looking at and look toward God. In Science of Mind, we turn away from physical conditions, the manifestations in the world around us, and we look toward what we call the spiritual truth or the Most High God. I always say that Science of Mind is preparation for mystical consciousness. That Ernest Holmes knew this, that if we stayed on the path seriously, and long enough, we would start to glimpse what the mystics of the ages saw. And mysticism is about the mystery. So we turn to that which we can never know fully, what Ernest Holmes called the absolute. Now that is a big God. Well, something that's so big we can never know it fully. You know, when people think that they can explain it, that is not a big enough God. That is, if you think you can explain it, Right? Any God that I can explain cannot heal my body. Any God that I can fully explain cannot heal my finances, cannot heal my relationships or my creative expression. Because there's no mystery in what I can explain. And the mystics of all ages, through all time and all cultures, have said that there's a mystery. There's a mystery component to it that I have to let go of all I think I know and turn to God. You know, again and again in the scriptures it says, look unto me. Emma Curtis Hopkins says it like this. She says, look up. Now she's using that as a metaphor. She doesn't really mean look up, all right? Because God's not up. You know, God is within. But what Emma is saying is she's saying, raise your consciousness. We look everywhere except where God is. Right? Look up is the call to raise your consciousness. And I understand. I mean, I really get it. We look down sometimes. Sometimes a lot we look down. You know, and why we look down sometimes is that we hurt. Things are not going well. We're troubled. Our heart's heavy. 
We feel tremendously burdened. I understand. We look down. But in the midst of all that the world uh, throws at us or pulls our attention to, you know, oh, my God, your life is so bad. It's never going to be better. This is the way it's going to be from now on. You're never going to be happy, healthy. You're never going to meet anybody. You're never going to have enough money. In the midst of all that, there is a voice that says, look unto me. Look to God. Not for God to do something for you, because Ernest Holmes is very clear. God's not going to do anything God's not already doing, right? But, so you don't look to God for God to do something. You look to God because your soul will settle for nothing less. There is something within your soul that hungers and thirsts to know God, and that is repent. That's the spiritual science component. See, our culture is crying out to know something greater than ourselves. Really, we are. All you have to do is turn on TV and see stuff about, you know, Atlantis and Lemuria and aliens and other universes and vampires and werewolves and angels and quantum physics and the Vulcan mind meld and the force. And it just goes on and on. People are looking to the mystery. They are. They are. But we do like to bring God down to our level. Instead of us getting bigger to realize more of the mystery, we make God smaller so we can understand it. We make God uh, small-minded and petty and vengeful. Now, God is none of that. God is none of that. We repent. We turn to God for the remission of sin. The remission being the backing away from Sin being a mistake, an error, a false belief, where we miss the mark. So when we turn to God, we will find within ourselves a remission, a backing away from the errors of our past, from the mistaken beliefs, from the false uh, identifications we've had. You know, the science of spirit teaches us that as you turn to the light, all that is in your consciousness will start to get lit up. All the error, all the belief that you are separate from God, starts to recede, right? The light always overcomes the darkness. So there was a man, John Newton, and he was a slave trader. He would go to Africa and steal people and enslave them and take them to Europe and sell them. It was all about the money for him. It was just about the money. He had no moral compass, I would say, whatsoever. Until there was a huge storm. And he gave up all hope. Now, it's important to know that he was an atheist. He did not believe in God. But when the storm got really big, really, really big, insert something in my personal life for storm. You do that right now. <laughs> he said, dear God, save us. When it got bad, really, really bad, I mean more bad than it had ever, ever been, he got on his knees, figuratively at least, and said, dear God, save us. Now, it got calm eventually, and he asked himself, what was I praying to? I didn't even know I believed. So out of that experience, he repented. He turned to God, and God turned to him. And there was a remission of sin. See, the sin, the error of selling another human being into slavery. And so what he did was that he turned his ship around. Instead of continuing on to Europe, where he was sure to make a lot of money, as he had again and again and again, he turned his ship around and went back to the coast of Africa and freed those people, freed his fellow human beings, because it was the right thing to do. And what came to him were the lyrics for Amazing Grace. You know, because he was changed. And this is what I'm talking about. He had an experience where he could no longer do what had been normal before. And see, this is the journey. If we're really doing the work on our journey, our behavior changes. We become different people, but not different because we're trying to be better, different from the inside out. 
So I love that when we sincerely turn to God, it seems like that we, we are pardoned from our history. Not that God forgives us, because I don't believe that God holds anything against us. But it's just about saying, you know, I believe when I turn to God, I'm saying that the presence of God is greater than my past, than my history, than my mistakes. When Jesus healed, he was making people whole. He was forgiving. And so I think today there are two, two things, at least, at least two things, that we've got to do. To be forgiven and have the mystery move into our life so we are made new, so that we, are, we will be made new in a way that we will never be the same again, it takes incredible humility. This is not a word you hear a lot in science of mind. It takes incredible humility because, you know, I'm here to tell you that to do the deeper spiritual work at some point, you've done all the changing you're thinking you can do to change your life, but to go deeper spiritually, it requires enormous humility to allow a power greater than you to use you. I mean, really use you. That humility, uh, I think, implies that we have to be teachable. In humility, when we are really humble, there can be a shift because we're open, we're teachable, we're willing. I think also it requires another uh, word that we don't use a lot in science of mind. It requires some sacrifice. In the Old Testament, Abraham wanted, and his wife, more than anything, they wanted a son. And so finally, after hundreds of years, they finally had a son. And that was what Abraham loved the most, was his son. And he was asked by God to sacrifice him. Now, I know he didn't want to do that, but he was willing. And so he didn't have to actually ultimately sacrifice his son. But because of his willingness, God made him the father of a great nation. And so when I look at that idea of sacrificing what we love most, I think what we love most is the idea of who we are. All of the ways that we're really special. All of the things that we think make us better than other people. You know, that we're attached to that. So I think we've got to be humble enough to sacrifice who I think I am. Have you ever gotten to a place in your life where you say, God, I just can't keep doing this? I mean, something just gets really, really no longer workable for you? you know, God, I just can't keep doing this. See, that's when you have to really start to look deeply within yourself. Do you ever say, you know what, no matter what, I'm never going to do that. I will never do that. I would never say that. I would never be a person who would do that. Most likely, you will have to give that up. You will have to give that notion up. Because you know what, exactly where we don't want to go is where we have to go, because that's what builds our faith. I'll tell you honestly, you know, I mean, I've been doing a lot of spiritual work for years. God, it seems like forever now. And... Um, And so I know without the work I've done, I wouldn't be who I am, and yet I continue to be amazed that little things crop up. Now, I will tell you, the good news is, after being on the path for a long time, I don't need great, big, ugly stuff to get my attention. Something really little can get my attention and keep me up all night. Yeah, something really, it's like, it's like a little grain of sand that gets inside the oyster, you know, that eventually be, will become the pearl. But right now, it's just a Big irritation, you know? So, so I've been having one of those lately, you know? I was just minding my own business. Just minding my own business and, 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 and sitting in my spiritual arrogance, you know? <laughs> Thinking, no, not me, never, I would never do that. I've forgiven everyone and everything, and I do that all the time. And I had just gotten out of my little prayer chair, and a name popped into my head. A name from like 40 years ago. 40, 40 years ago. I have not even thought about, I mean, entire decades have gone by. 
and I have not thought of this person. And I just went to that deep, dark, ugly place I try not to live anymore. I did, it was just, it was like, oh no, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it after all this work. And there, all I had to do was just like, be a little arrogant and poof, here comes, oh yeah, you think you're so spiritual? You think you're so evolved? How about this name? So Ernest Holmes teaches us in the textbook, he said that Jesus was not the great exception, but Jesus was the great example. The example of what we were in the process of becoming. So I think that to go deeper spiritually, there has to be humility and there has to be a willingness to, to sacrifice. Sacrifice my old ideas or my spiritual arrogance or a way of being that no longer serves me. You know, and Emma says that when you do that, then what happens is you are crowned with understanding. Isn't that fantastic? That you are, I love her words, that you are crowned with understanding. You know, understanding, you know, is, 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 that's the truth, she says, that's in all teachings, that all of the great mystical teachings have understanding of, of the essential truths. So I know today, today, here we are, season of light, this could be a turning point for you if you are willing. Today could be the signpost along the way. Where down the road you're going to look back and say, yep, it was in the season of light in 2014 that everything changed for me. I was willing and I was changed. Because you know, the light that we are filled with, the light of God, you know, it's the light of the mystery, and and the more we yield to that, the more we say yes to it, the more we are new. So, so think about this right now. From, from today on, we, you, me, are going to leave what behind? Just whatever comes to you. What is it that you would choose from today forward to leave that behind? you would be happy to say, that is no longer me. That, that months from now, you would look back and say, you know, it was in that season of light that I stopped and you fill in. It was in that season of light that I became and you fill in. It was in that season of light that I started to and you fill in. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a saying in 12-step um, in programs that my best thinking got me here. And so I know for myself that um, um, that becomes not enough. You know, that, that the work of my own hand um, is not enough. To, to, to go uh, where I really want to go, um, that it takes humility and a willingness to sacrifice, and what we get is understanding. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward this morning to recognize that right here where we are, God is, that we are surrounded and filled with a presence of infinite love and infinite light light that is understanding itself. And so I speak the word for each and every one of us that we are willing this day for all separation, for all belief in separation, that we could be separate from God or love or we could be separate from our good, that all of that is healed right now. I claim for each and every one of us that today is a turning point, that we'll look back and see this as a signpost in our life where we have let go of all that keeps us from expressing the divinity within us. That the sin of not realizing our divine potential, we just back away from that right now, fully and completely, and we allow God to be God by means of us in a way that we have never known before. And so we include in our prayer today family members and friends and loved ones. We know that right where they are, the fullness, the allness of God's spirit, God's love is right there. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world, especially all those situations that come to mind that look so difficult, so fearful to us. 
we claim a peace that goes beyond all human understanding. The perfect activity of God, of light, of love, right there. Surrounding, filling, healing, revealing peace. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain this day that we are blessed by being together, that we all get raised up in consciousness, that something that no longer serves us is let down. We lay it down. We're done with it. We're complete with that. And in that healed place, there is an opening for the newness of God to come forward. And so I claim for each and every one of us, we stand as open, willing, receptive vessels for spirits abundant, loving expression in the world. And so with a great full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.